I want to take us quickly through what we call our seven steps to success, and I'm going to briefly take you through each of the seven elements to get any public sector organization to deliver value. We've replicated this model, not just in Rochester, but now dozens of organizations from the state level down to the county level, down to literally school districts, to get them to be able to produce value. So in places like Detroit, not exactly known for its high performance government, uh, being able to produce results. I heard someone from Las Vegas, we've worked very closely uh, with the transit system there. Uh, out on Long Island, Baton Rouge, as I said, dozens of others to deliver that balanced success of value to the taxpayer and value to the customer. Step one, a clear definition of what success looks like. If we as public sector leaders do not define what success looks like, guess who will? Everybody else. Reporters, auditors, political appointment, appoint, opponents, union leaders, if we've not put the stake in the ground as to what success looks like, everyone else will do it for us. Own what success looks like. I want to play a clip for you of what I would author is one of the greatest success moments in our nation's history. You'll recognize the clip immediately. What I'd urge you to listen for is listen how the speaker talks about taking long-range goals and putting them into an urgent time manner. Listen to how he talks about making the priority. Listen to how he talks about taking budget, our resources, and investing them to deliver success. Not just adopt a budget, but adopt a budget in order to deliver success as we've defined it. The facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Any confusion over what success looks like? Man to the moon and back safely by the end of the earth, uh, by the end of the decade. A, uh, a little known fact lost to history is the president's top NASA advisor, a professor from MIT, wanted him to find success as sending a dog to the moon, period. There was no mention of bringing Fluffy home. President clearly put a stake in the ground and said, this is what success looks like. This is what we've got the ability to deliver. I spoke on this quickly, but a principle that I would leave with you all is to select one space to be best in class. We cannot be great at everything. If we try to, it's a commitment to mediocrity to all. Pick the space that we want to be amazing and deliver value. The private sector gets this. Rolex has chosen to be amazing at quality. They are lousy at price. Think of an organization that made the exact opposite choice. Amazing at price and lousy at quality. I would argue that Rolex and Walmart are exactly the same organization. They just made opposite choices. But it's that strategic focus of not chasing the squirrel, of knowing where you want to be best in class and committing yourself to causing that to happen. You might recognize this president. Listen to how he defines success and think about, because we'll all know this one, think about how he focused his administration to deliver upon success as he defined it. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, 
Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Any confusion over what success looks like? Built a budget to be able to cause that to happen, stood his ground at Rekivec. Clarity over what success looked like, picking that space. And you think of those two examples with Kennedy and Reagan, I would argue two of the greatest performances of getting government to actually work in the 20th century. Throw a, uh, throw a World War II victory in there, you probably got the three. Two of those clips really go to the president providing that leadership and demonstrating that clarity. Compare it to how this person, whom we'll all recognize, was pushed by a reporter to define what success looked like. You may have heard of this piece of legislation, it was pretty quiet, called Obamacare. Listen to how she defines success. What does success look like? Well, I think success looks like uh, at least 7 million people having signed up by the end of March 2014. The reporter pushed her to define success. And then what happened? We all watched that the administration spent seven months saying she didn't say that. I actually applaud the secretary for putting the stake in the ground and saying this. Sometimes we'll miss, right? Sometimes we won't get it done. We may not send a man to the moon and back by the end of the decade. But control the conversation. Put the stake in the ground as to what success looked like. Step one, define success. Step two, build a plan to be able to cause it to happen. A plan that will allow us to call the plays. The football coach called today about having the game plan. Today we watch football where they have the game plans all sketched out what they're gonna do. Somehow professional football players have become uh, lip readers today, so we have to cover our mouths now, we can't watch. But they have a plan in front of them to deliver success as it has been defined. One of the key elements of getting everyone to be on the same page is to actually have a page. Actually have a document that says this is what success looks like and budget is not a plan. If budget were a plan, these people would be amazing at it because every year they have budgets, but not a plan to be able to deliver success. You know, I know we, and I say we as conservatives, love to smack on Amtrak as a subsidy. The new CEO at Amtrak, been there for the last four years now, has followed this model of recognizing, define success, build a plan, create my budget to fund that, and the results have been fantastic. Subsidies at Amtrak are down 20% from what they were five years ago. Debt is down more than a billion five. Ridership is up double digits. Following this concept that simply adopting a budget is not enough, we actually have to have a plan in place to be able to cause it to occur. Define success, plan to achieve it. We need a measurement system to track, is my plan working or not? That comes from the ability to measure what matters. If you have not seen the movie Moneyball or read the book, I highly recommend reading the book because the book is a phenomenal book, I would argue, about public sector management and how to look at not data. Government is amazing at data. We are lousy at information to make business decisions. And so this clip I'm gonna play for you talks about how do we distill all of this, I'm gonna move from another analogy from baseball, all of this sap, right? It takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. How do we go from all this data to be able to produce information? Listen to how the movie describes about getting things down to one number, information. So using this equation on the upper left right here, I'm projecting that we need to win at least 99 games in order to make it to the postseason. We need to score at least 814 runs in order to win those games and allow no more than 645 runs. What's this? This is the code that I've written for our year-to-year -year projections. This is building in all the intelligence that we have to project players. Okay. It's about getting things down to one number. Using the stats the way we read them, we'll find value in players that nobody else can see. Now, I'm sure this has never happened at one of your legislative hearings where the Republicans debate that these numbers are the ones that are important and we should pay attention to, and the Democrats debate that these are the numbers we should look and pay important to. 
are the reporters likely going to write about our numbers or their numbers? If we have defined success, and if we have a simple scorecard in place that is agreed to upon ahead of time, we literally, this is the agency that I ran, we literally created a stock price for a public agency. There is one number that defines what success looks like. There's a lot that goes behind that, clearly. A lot of information is flying behind that. I would argue it's like your iPhone, right? It's simple and intuitive on its surface, but there's a lot that's spinning beneath it. But between having goals for every metric and having them prioritized, we're able to roll that up to one number, and there is no debating the one number. Our stock either went up or it went down. As a public agency, that's public sector service with a private sector mindset. That's getting things to be simplified at the easiest level. Step four, creating a culture of ownership. Accountability is simple. I can create an accountability system at any organization, but how do we get hearts and minds to be invested so people actually care about the results of their scorecard? They are invested emotionally as to whether or not we've got the ability to be successful. President Kennedy was taking a tour at NASA after he made his famous speech. And in an unsuspecting moment, he walked across the lobby and happened to run into the custodian who was working. And the president said to the man, what do you do here? And the man looked up to him and he said, Mr. President, I'm sending a man to the moon. Clarity over the ownership that he took in his work. That's what we're looking to get. He wasn't being held accountable for sweeping. There was a culture of ownership to get him to be invested. The man you're looking at on the screen is my now dear friend, Caesar McFadden. 12 years ago, he was not my dear friend. He was my mortal enemy. Caesar McFadden is a six foot five inch, 350 pound bus driver in Rochester, New York, continues to be today. And in my first couple of months as CEO, I'm standing up in front of a room full of 500 drivers and mechanics in our garage, buses around the edges, and I'm explaining to them, we've got this huge deficit, and people want to raise fares, they want to lay off the employees, I don't want to do that, I want to rebuild. And I'm squinting because Caesar is standing in the back, all six foot five of them, gold chains around, he's got a sign around his neck which says liar, which was not a name tag. And Caesar starts to jump ugly as I begin to move to questions. You don't care about us. You don't understand. You just have all your fancy math. That's not how it works. And Caesar wound up leading a walkout of all of our drivers. They got up, walked out. I was 37, looked around and said, huh, I think one of the key parts of Having a bus company is you actually need people to drive the buses. We don't seem to have any of those. Fortunately, they only left for the media and they actually went out and drove buses, which was good. Didn't think I was going to be a 38-year-old CEO. The point being, a culture had been created at the organization of look after myself first rather than the organization. For years, the previous leadership had had a Christmas party where they would serve barbecued ribs and chicken and salt potatoes and corn, and they would tell all the employees, bring your friends, bring your family, eat and enjoy. We would have drivers show up with 15 family members. They would eat as much as they could, as fast as they could, pile their three plates high in each arm, covered in aluminum foil, and head for the exits. Now, we didn't have a deficit because people were eating barbecued ribs, right? It's a small expense, not a big deal. But it's the mindset. If the organization exists to give me barbecued ribs today, tomorrow you exist to give me pension, health care, and salary increases. You exist to give me things. I don't have to adjust my behavior. 71% on-time performance is good enough. 16% clean buses is good enough. Where's my pay? It had been 30 years of creating this culture that they had to be able to perform differently, creating that culture of ownership so folks are invested. Step five, making adjustments in the midst of the year. If a team is down three touchdowns, do they continue to run the same plays after halftime? No, you make adjustments. Success is unwavering. We will score more points than the other team, but we need to make adjustments during the course of the year to be able to get to success and arrive at what the, the ultimate goal is. 
In government, we tend to be amazing at rewarding people for the effort they put forth rather than the results they produce. Touchdown passes, throw me touchdown passes. That's what we're looking to get to rather than the effort we put forth. We tend to reward people for eating tomato soup with a fork rather than getting tomato soup into our bellies. Quick example here, customer service is not the objective. Customer satisfaction is the goal. Customer service is what we do to people. Customer satisfaction is the rating of how well we did it. So we've built a whole measurement system around not improving customer service, but measuring customer satisfaction and then going back and fixing those areas that need to be improved for the customer to be able to deliver it perfectly. Have you ever been to a restaurant where they greet you, bring your food, they bring your bill, all the things, they leave, the owner smiles at you, hope he says you enjoyed yourself, and you get to the car and say, we're never going to go back there again. They're inside celebrating all their customer service metrics, and we left unsatisfied. How do we change the dynamic to be able to measure customer sat rather than measure customer service? And measuring whether people have swiped their time clock, measuring the effort they put forth, is not how we create that culture change. Step six, courage in decision making. Honoring people for demonstrating courage in the process to be able to deliver value. Getting people to be succeeders rather than survivors. To take risks and to create a culture where we honor people for taking risks and the value that produces. Hopefully you recognize this American hero, Rob O'Neill. I interviewed him. You'll see a story on him in the chapter in Courage in the new book. Rob O'Neill, who don't know, uh, uh, shot three bullets into Osama bin Laden's head and killed him. Demonstrated incredible courage with his team. I would argue that a man demonstrated great courage to allow Rob O'Neill to do that, and that was the president. He could have fired off a drone, could have dropped a bomb, you all remember what happened when President Carter sent helicopters in to uh, save the Iranian hostages. They crashed in the desert, and I would argue, so did his reelection. President Obama could have made those same decisions, and he didn't. I would argue demonstrated great courage in taking the risk to send those troops in. I would also argue it was completely unlike every other decision he's ever made, uh, with the fact that he put such risk, put his own survival, his political survival at risk, to cause that to happen. The fact that it succeeded allowed the president to give this speech. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. Atypical of the president's decision making to tip, put himself at risk, but I would argue in that decision, he did put himself at risk. We tend to associate courage with whether the decision worked. And it's a courageous decision because it's courageous, not because it was successful. I would have applauded the president for his courage, whether the raid worked or not, because it was courageous. Quick example, how many of you remember the New England Patriots-Seattle Seahawks Super Bowl game. We all remember how it ended, right? Do you remember this play? End of the first half, six seconds to go, Seahawks are down seven, no timeouts. Ball's on the 11-yard uh, line. No-brainer decision, right, kick the field goal. No-brainer decision. Watch what happens, end of the first half. He's got to get rid of it in a hurry. And he does, and it's caught! Touchdown! All of the smart people on TV during halftime spent the entire time talking about what a courageous decision the coach had made. Because it worked! It was either courageous or it wasn't. It can't be evaluated based upon the fact that it succeeded because they made the same call at the end of the football game, we'll recall, right? There's 25 seconds to go. Similar call. Risky. Play clock at five. Pass is intercepted at the goal line by Malcolm Butler. Unreal. Malcolm Butler. We 
can't be a genius on one hand and two hours later we're a moron making the same sorts of decisions. Quickly want to create a two by two here for you of what we do in government. Look at the courageous decision making. So across the top, private sector, public sector, down the side, whether it goes well or it goes poorly. In the private sector, if we make a courageous decision and it goes well, we are promoted, we get bonuses. In the private sector, make a courageous decision and it goes poorly and we get fired. In the public sector, make a courageous decision, a risk-laden decision, and have it go poorly, and we are terminated on the front page of the newspaper. And so are you. Right? Make a risk decision and you are terminated, but on the front page of the newspaper. And make a risk-laden decision and have it go well, you might get a smiley face in your performance review, if there is a performance review in your organization, which there might not be. We ought to change that so people actually are invested in the results. Finally, the seventh step is to honor what the results are. To pull people back together again and acknowledge whether or not the plan worked. Share with people what performance looked like. It allowed us to celebrate six months ahead of the deadline the fact that we landed a man in, on the moon safely. It allowed President uh, Reagan to have the biggest chunk of the Berlin Wall sitting at the library. My friend Caesar McFadden. The first year that we ran a surplus and we were not forced to be able to raise fares, we had this big hoopla. It was like a convention. We had a balloon drop and we're playing U2's It's a Beautiful Day. Every year when we had submitted a plan in the past, it was only the CEO that signed the plan and sent it into the board. And I said to the employees, if you helped this past year, if you got out of the wagon, got into the mud and helped to pull us through this, you decide not me. Please come up and we're all going to sign the plan this year. We're all going to submit it. Balloons are falling, confetti's going off. Caesar comes up, all six foot five of him with his sunglasses on in the garage, looks down at me and he growls, I ain't going to sign the plan. And I'm thinking but not saying, dude, it's a celebration. I'm not sure you saw the balloons. This is a good thing. And he said, I'm not going to sign the plan because I don't deserve to. I took cheap shots, I made a fool of myself and my family, but next year I'll be able to sign the plan. That is a culture of ownership. That is getting employees to be invested. We still had our Christmas party every year. People could eat as much as they wanted. Not a morsel of food left the building. That same group of employees baked Christmas cookies at home and had a Christmas cookie competition to compete internally. It was not how much can I take out, it's what can I do to participate. Juxtapose those drivers and mechanics with people with master's degrees in Madison, Wisconsin saying, where's mine? It shows how a culture can be shifted to get people to be able to be invested. We didn't raise fares. We were the only transit system in America that actually reduced them and increased non-taxpayer revenue. We reduced the amount of money the government had to put in place. On-time performance from 71 to 91. Bus cleanliness quadrupled. Not because of me, because the culture shifted. Success was clearly defined. Last clip I want to play is President Reagan talking on his last address to the American people from the Oval Office. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. And I would argue that success looks like creating that culture where taxpayers are winning, where employees are winning, where customers are winning, and the equality of the experience that we're delivering for people is of high value.